Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cancer. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, we're going to talk about uh, the KRAS protein in a bit more detail than we've ever talked about it before. And in specific, specifically, what we're going to look at uh, is um, how you can get uh, point mutations which produce a gain of function in this uh, KRAS protein. So uh, we've looked now at Burkitt's lymphoma, which gives us a good example of how you can get a gain of function mutation by uh, translocating a gene so that it's now controlled by a different promoter region and that other promoter region is far more active than the promoter region of that original uh, proto-oncogene. So, uh, that can cause a gain of function mutation. In this video, what we're going to see is how a point mutation in the gene, uh, which leads to a single amino acid change in uh, the protein, can then lead to, um, can then lead to an activation of this uh, protein, and, and therefore a gain of function mutation. So before we do that, what I want to do is I want to just remind ourselves of the growth factor receptor pathway and where KRAS is important in that growth factor receptor pathway. And then what we'll do is we'll discuss how uh, we can get gain of function mutations in KRAS and how those will uh, constitute an oncogene basically and will promote oncogenesis. Okay, so uh, KRAS is involved in the MAP kinase ERK pathway, which is a pathway downstream of growth factor receptors. So let's say um, here is a phospholipid bilayer of a cell. Okay, and let's say this here is a growth factor receptor. Right, so. This is our growth factor receptor. So let's say uh, this cell has been stimulated with growth factor then. So I'll just highlight the growth factor receptor in orange here. So let's say that the cell has been stimulated with growth factor. So in comes the growth factor, which we'll denote just by a little box. And we'll highlight that in green. And what's going to happen is this growth factor is going to bind to the extracellular domain of the growth factor receptor. So this is the growth factor, and I'm deliberately keeping it nice and general, uh, so we're not talking about any specific growth factors, so, but if you want a specific example, you could think of epidermal growth factor, or EGF would be your specific example, epidermal growth factor. Okay, um, and uh, here's our growth factor receptor, so again, completely general. Uh, again, if you're thinking of this specific example of epidermal growth factor, then this would be the epidermal growth factor receptor, the EGFR. Okay, so growth factor receptor, but the, gem the specific example would be the epidermal growth factor receptor. Okay, right, uh, so what's going to happen is that the growth factor is going to bind to the extracellular domain of this uh, growth factor receptor. And when it does, it will change the conformation of the growth factor receptor so that um, the growth factor receptor takes on a conformation where it can now dimerize with another growth factor receptor. So let's draw this here. All right, so it's changed conformation and it's now got uh, the ability to dimerize with another growth factor receptor. So I draw another one that has also bound to growth factor. So these two receptors have both bound to growth factor. So I'll show the growth factor bound here. And they have now both changed conformation so that they are now capable of dimerizing. Okay. And what's now going to happen is indeed they are going to dimerize. Uh, and uh, that will then um, cause um, a change which then leads to the signal being transduced. Okay, so here are our two growth factor receptors now having taken on a conformation uh, where they can dimerize together. So now let's show them dimerizing together. Alright, so what's going to happen is you're going to form a dimer. So here's the phospholipid bilayer again. Here's our first growth factor receptor. So we'll label this one the first growth factor receptor and we'll label this growth factor receptor 2. Okay, and growth factor receptor 1 has now joined together with growth factor receptor 2 here. Okay. Now, and they've still obviously both got growth factor bound to them, otherwise they aren't in a conformation where they're capable of dimerizing together. So, this is our growth factor receptor dimer 
which forms once the growth factor receptors have bound to their growth factor. So here's our dimer now. All right. Uh, so next, what's going to happen is you're going to get auto, what's known as autophosphorylation of this growth factor receptor dimer. So um, basically, there's another name for growth factor receptors. Growth factor receptors can also be called receptor tyrosine kinases. Receptor tyrosine kinases. And the reason they can be called this is because they have a tyrosine kinase enzyme uh, within them, basically. Uh, and the tyrosine kinase enzyme is an enzyme which is capable of putting a uh, phosphate group onto a tyrosine amino acid. So let me remind you of the structure of the tyrosine amino acid. So if this is the amino group of our amino acid, so this is at the moment we're just talking about the backbone of the amino acid, here's the alpha carbon, and then down here is the carboxyl group coming off the alpha carbon. So there's the carboxylic acid group. And then we have a hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon, so that's the case for all amino acids. Now, in the case of tyrosine, you then have this R group. So you have a methylene group, like so. And then you have a benzene ring. So let's draw this benzene ring here. And then, so that's a benzene ring. And then you have a hydroxyl group off the fourth carbon of the benzene ring. Right, and it is this hydroxyl group of the fourth carbon of the benzene ring that can be phosphorylated. So if I draw a phosphate group here, a phosphate group consists of a phosphorus atom at the centre, double bonded to an oxygen, then with a two hydroxyl groups coming off it, and then also a single bond with another oxygen which has gained an electron from somewhere, so it um, has a negative charge. Okay, so if you want to uh, bind uh, a phosphate group to the hydroxyl group of a tyrosine uh, residue, what you can do is remove the hydroxyl group from the phosphorus atom, remove the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group of the tyrosine, and uh, produce water from that. So that's why this reaction is known as a condensation reaction, because you produce water. And then you bind the oxygen to the phosphorus atom. Now, kinases don't generally uh, produce these um, phosphorylations of these amino acid groups uh, like this. They don't generally use an inorganic phosphate, as I've drawn here. Instead, generally what they use is ATP, and they cut the uh, third phosphate group off ATP and then stick it onto the tyrosine. And the hydrolysis of the ATP gives the energy that then drives the next reaction. Okay, so the important thing to understand is that these receptor tyrosine kinases, or these uh, growth factor receptors, have in them, basically, a domain which is capable of catalyzing this reaction. So I'll draw it here, let's say. So here's this tyrosine kinase domain. And basically, each of the growth factor receptors also has some tyrosine residues, which I'll just draw as these sort of lines along the side. Okay, and what's going to happen in autophosphorylation is that the receptor, well, the tyrosine kinase uh, domain here of receptor 1 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of receptor 2, and the tyrosine kinase domain of receptor 2 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of growth factor receptor 1. So, that process is known as autophosphorylation, where the tyrosine residues become phosphorylated. Okay, so autophosphorylation. Right, so uh, what's going to happen then is if I denote phosphate groups by pink dots, then you're going to get pink dots on all of these tyrosine residues. So you get phosphate groups being added onto the tyrosine. And I want to um, stress that it's not the uh, tyrosine kinase of receptor 1 phosphorylating its own tyrosine residues. That might, you might be misled by autophosphorylation, which means self-phosphorylation. So you might be tempted to think that this um, 
the um, kinase domain, the tyrosine kinase domain of receptor 1 will phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of receptor 1, but it's not. It's the tyrosine kinase domain of receptor 1 phosphorylating the um, tyrosine residues of receptor 2, and uh, receptor 2 then phosphorylates the tyrosine residues of receptor 1. So it's autophosphorylation within the dimer rather than within the individual growth factor receptor. Okay, so now, once you've had autophosphorylation occur, what can come and bind is a protein can come and bind to this, uh, these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. And this protein has the rather fantastic name of growth factor receptor binding protein 2, which is a nice sensible name. Growth factor, oh dear, I've missed one out, receptor. Never mind. Now I've ruin the picture by writing that name underneath where I want to draw next. Growth factor receptor binding protein 2. Okay, and because that's a bit of a mouthful, people often abbreviate it to GRB2. Uh, so they take the growth from here, G from here, the R from receptor, and then B for binding, and then the 2. So GRB2, this protein is often referred to as. Okay, so let me colour in GRB2. We'll have it in blue. Right, so GRB2 binds to the phosphorylated tyrosine residues of the growth factor receptor once it has undergone the process of autophosphorylation. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.